on doing today is doing a few skills training pieces to help familiarize you with the different types of lobbying that you can engage in to help convince your member of Congress, both in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, to get on board with us to close the School of the Americas. Um, after that, we'll give you some kind of top 10 tips, uh, the best tips that you can use to be an effective lobbyist when you're talking about closing the School of the Americas. And we'll have a few breakout sessions. Um, you might see that we have the SOA Watch Regions listed up here on poster board uh, around the room. And you'll get a chance to meet with people uh, from different parts of the country in different states near you to help figure out what's going on legislatively in your area and how you can cooperate um, and build a legislative campaign, either with your local group or people that might live near you. Um, there's also going to be a part today where I help talk you through the different bills and campaigns that we do in Congress so that you're familiar with some of the basic terminology and some of the things that we're going to be facing uh, in the next few months. Uh, we can expect between two and three uh, votes in the U.S. Congress uh, just in the next six or seven months. So it's really great that you all are here to help learn about that process. So the first person that's going to speak to you today is Jack Gilroy, um, who you just met, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, what is lobbying. Actually, these on the on the order of uh, uh, Pam. Pam said uh, you really have to ask the question of people: uh, What is lobbying? Because a lot of people have lobbied. A lot of you out here have done this uh, many times, right? And you may be able to come up with uh, a better response than me and let me off the hook too. So if you can tell me uh, what you think, you know, a rough definition of, uh, of what is lobbying, uh, you might uh, be able to fulfill my job of doing what my boss here has told me to do, right? What is lobbying? What, what would you say is uh, uh, an example of lobbying? How would you, how would you explain lobbying itself? Any action that um, you take to persuade your elected official to do something you want them to do. Okay, I think that's fine. Speak up. Uh, persuading of, of any actions you may take to persuade your elected officials to fulfill your your wishes, right? Uh, now, what, what, how do you go about doing that? I guess the question that follows that is, uh, how do you how do you fulfill that? And again, I'm asking you because again, you can help other people right here by giving your specific examples. How do you do that? You can find out some background about your particular elected officials, how they stand on the issue. Okay, how do you check their background? Is there any particular way that you would check that, that out? We have a Facebook that we use in Georgia. I don't know if that's universal or not. But Facebook has a picture and has their, who they are, personal information, as well as the committees that they serve on. So that helps me know how much they know about me. I don't want to miss the opportunity here to say that Pam is our expert on this. She really, you know, she spends full time investigating the Congress, uh, the House of Representatives, the Senate of the United States. The office of the School of the Americas Watch is in Washington, and Pam is there checking out the stats. So if you have a question, uh, if you, uh, uh, it's email or it's P. Bowman, it's on one of those lists there, right, at the soaw.org. And if you're looking for some background information, I'm sure that Pam will, she'll have that information back to you. But then you can also just kind of, you can Google it, right? You can go on and uh, you can get into, uh, uh, Thomas would be uh, uh, a good uh, uh, resource to uh, use, just to uh, Google Thomas legislative uh, ac action and you'll find out what the uh, uh, people are up to. Any other uh, uh, points on that, on lobbying? Yes, sir. I was going to say petitioning or uh, bombarding them with letters, or your, your representative. Writing, uh, right, writing, writing a letter. If you were to write a letter, uh, would you prefer an email letter or some other? Uh, I would say, I would say, maybe both. Just do both of them. Uh, but you know, anytime I've done it, uh, postal service. But I mean, a postcard. No, like a like a letter and a letter with like yeah, a letter. Yeah, regular letter is yeah. fine. Uh, some would say too, if you do it yeah. Some would say that even the best is a handwritten, oh, right. right? A handwritten letter. 
uh, but sometimes they say they have a hard time reading them, so maybe a, a, a printed out. Don't underestimate the power of a postcard, right? Postcards are very important, and Teresa Cameronisi from uh, California in Pelosi's district knows that because she has been sending thousands of postcards out, not just to uh, Congressman Pelosi, but to congressmen and senators throughout the United States for some years now. And if you didn't sign it today, if you didn't do that, then tomorrow is it going to be available? No, not no. Not Okay, but you can do it on, you can do it, pretty much do it on your own. You can get the postcards by uh, calling the office and get boxes of postcards. You get them. But we need a new one. With the, yeah, we need postcards to be updated information. There will be updated postcards coming, so stay tuned to uh, SOAW.org. Yes, sir. I'd be interested in Pam's take on this because I've had other legislative people tell me all I do is a head count, but I don't care if it's an email, paper mail. Uh, handwritten, handwritten in blood or what, or just keep count, yes, no, yes, 20 yeses, five no's. Pam, what's your take on that? Yeah, that's part of it. I mean, each congressional office keeps a count. So, for instance, if they're having a vote on ending the Iraq War, um, they'll keep a tally. You know, what are the reasons that somebody wants to do this, yes or no, um, how many calls are we getting, etc. But there is kind of a tier of what's the best communication that you can have with a congressional office. And one of the best things, which is an example of lobbying, is having a direct visit with your member of Congress, either in the local district office in your community, or coming to Washington, D.C. to meet with their D.C. staff. Um, but emails, letters, uh, phone calls, they're all equally part of the process of communicating with that office. Um, but if, when you compare kind of down to the nitty gritty, having a handwritten letter is going to be much better than having a typed form letter, like a mass letter that's being sent. So always good to really personalize the letters and communications you send. <coughs> right, and uh, we have talked to staffers uh, who have been into over 100 congressional offices, and uh, they do say that they really do like to have a personal letter rather than an email letter. It's, it's looked over. A strategy that some of us have used as well with letters is that if you're in a group, let's say you have uh, back in uh, Oshkosh or whatever, you have 15 people who want to write letters in to a certain congressperson to close the U.S. Army School of the Americas Wednesday. Uh, don't send them all out of jit in one bunch. Write your letter, probably get together as a group, and send three or four out one day, a couple days later, send a few more out. That way you're hitting that office with that issue, not once, but a number of times. They are a bit turned off at bulk mailings when they just get a big bulk mailing with a uh, standard written, printed out uh, statement and somebody's signature on the bottom. So again, even personal postcards, if not letters, uh, would be very good. Now what about that point that Pam was, was making about your district office? It's so important. A lot of us, you know, walk the halls of Congress. Well, what about your district office? Uh, what do you, how do you set up an appointment? Have you ever done that? Have you ever had any problems with that uh, in contacting people? Uh, I, I'm trying to right now. I, uh, my, one of my senators has an online uh, you know, form that you fill out if you want an appointment. And so I'm not sure how long to wait before I call them. And I, I have not had two weeks now. So, but you know, it's just got over the election. So. Okay, well, yeah, I think the easiest way is to make the call. <clears throat> and make sure that the people have your name because very often you're getting uh, an individual at the front desk and to have them uh, spell it back to you, in fact, right? And that way they don't think, oh, this person is really pretty serious about this, right? And then ask for a specific time to see the, uh, the person, the representative, the congressman. Most likely you're not going to see the congresswoman or the congressman, but you will see the representative because keep in mind that each congressional district, if you don't know where that office is, it's going to be in one of your counties at a federal building, most likely, right? Usually in a federal building. Uh, find out where it is. Know the name of your congressman. Uh, Teresa has found over the years that many people don't have a clue. That's why they have to check the zip codes, right? To find out who the congressperson is. Find out the name of the person. Very often the guy's name is in the uh, white pages. Mine is Maurice Henchy. Right? Maurice Enchi is right in there, just as Jack Gilroy is in there, right? You know, so you can just check the number out that. Or go to the, usually the blue pages under government, and you'll see U.S. government, and go and get U.S. Congress. You can call them up. 
and try to make an appointment. Don't forget that there's also a cold call. Go right to the office, go to the district office and tell the secretary you have an important issue and you'd really like to talk to the district representative. Again, district representative, not the congressman, right? Because every day a district representative will be on the phone at the end of the day to call Washington and give a report of what's going on, if they're doing their job, right? And uh, they're going to call in and say, oh yeah, I had this person in, and I had two or three people in, and they're talking about uh, WinSec, and I've never even heard of it. You'll find a lot of that with new people coming into Congress. So that's another uh, thing to, to keep in mind. Now, suppose they are not going to uh, pay any attention. You try all of these issues. You try to contact them, uh, they won't respond. Uh, you send letters, there's no response. So you may have to think about upping the ante. Maybe you have to go to the federal building with, a, with that poster saying, where is our congressman or congresswoman on this issue? You know, and talk to people in the street. Uh, there are various creative, nonviolent methods you have of sometimes even embarrassing these individuals. If they're running for election, re-election, then do bird dogging. Follow them around and have your question to ask, right? Uh, stand up and ask your question as to you have not given us a response uh, to why you are for or against uh, the Western Hemisphere Institute of Security Cooperation. We just say WinSec. Uh, and people say, what are they talking about? She may be forced or he may be forced to give an example of what they think it is, and then you can cross-examine them a bit more. So all of those uh, uh, methods, there's a petition to close the School of the Americas that you can find online at soaw.org or it's not available down on the street. Uh, Teresa had it uh, uh, there at her table today. Letters to the editor are very powerful, very powerful. Don't make them too long. You can really say it in a couple of paragraphs. Get somebody else to read it over after you do it. Put it send an email saying, hey, here's a letter I'm sending. What do you think? And they'll probably tell you that you spelled some words wrong if you're they're like me, if you're like me, or that maybe if you didn't use it uh, your language probably. Get it down nice and neat, clear, precise, and then get it out to them. And uh, Go to a number of newspapers. If you live in a metropolitan area, send it to a whole bunch of uh, uh, newspapers. Now that's basically all. Uh, I think. Here's a question. Question, question about question. It. Yes. Um, if, you're, if I'm planning a campaign, you know, with an organization, would I do it now or would I do it after January the 20th? Yeah. Oh, on a, on a particular. We're already elected, right? So I would start. I would start. You know, we are going to. Some of us are going to be down in Congress on January 12th uh, because the new staff will be in. Okay? So we want to get to them very soon and be able to educate them. So it, it's, it's not too late. You can start now, really. And uh, it will get to the new people even yes, though Yes, yes. And there's no problem with sending to, uh, to a, an office of a newly elected uh, individual. Uh, after, say, should they wait uh, to send to uh, a person when they're sworn in, or how long do they? Yes. Well, um, Congress, uh, all of the new members of Congress that have just been elected in the past couple weeks, they are still getting their offices assigned to them, um, but they come in to Washington, D.C. in December uh, before the Christmas and New Year's holidays to do an orientation with some of the people that have been there for years and years. They learn things like parliamentary procedure, um, how to hire your staff, um, how to set up your website in an effective way. So it might be a little bit difficult for you to reach your member of Congress if they've just been elected until after New Year's. But by that first full business week in January, they usually have um, at least a skeleton staff in place so that you're able to give them a call and get a fax number or get an address. So a better response would be probably wait until after New Year's, right? Uh, but yeah, we uh, we found uh, that going down early, uh, it's kind of casual, a casual feeling among many of the uh, staff. You sometimes you still smell the paint on the walls, you know, and uh, the detergent, and they, uh, they wear jeans or whatever because it's not the formal time. You don't see uh, the big corporate guys walking around, right, uh, with, uh, with their particular issues. So it's a good time for us to get in and talk to these people they're usually quite young. It's not unusual to see staff as 22, 23, and they, they need to be informed, and they're usually very receptive. Thanks. Thanks, Jack. Yep.
first breakout session, uh, I wanted to give you a perspective on some of the top 10 tips for lobbying. Um, something you might not have heard if I've spoken several times today on some of the different stages. Uh, but just to give you an idea of my background, I uh, am a former legislative assistant to a member for, of Congress from the state of Texas. And this is, that's actually how I learned about the School of the Americas. Um, my, the congressman that I worked for used to go to all of the SOA protests. He want, really wants to close the school down. He helps us out um, a lot with our work. Um, and so that's how I ended up finding out about the school. So I've really seen the other side of it. I know what it means to uh, you know, talk with a member of Congress and learn how they make their decisions, um, to kind of learn how a congressional office operates and how you can best address their needs and try to get your point across. And so I wanted to give you a few tips from my experience to help make your lobbying more effective. Okay. So, uh, number 10, um, and this is an overarching, best, most important uh, you know, tool for you to use when you're lobbying, and that is relationship building. It's building the most positive relationship that you can have with that congressional office. And it involves so many different components, something as simple as after your meeting, making sure you maintain a good relationship with the aide or the assistant that you meet with. Um, because especially in the last few years, people have been going to congressional offices to meet with people on more than just the issue of closing the School of the Americas. You want to be able to build a relationship with that office to help you out on all sorts of issues, like however you feel about um, the Iraq War or how we're spending um, our money on all sorts of things and how the economy is functioning. So you want to be able to go back to that office on a number of issues and you don't want to make them angry um, or make them upset and kind of burn those bridges with somebody who's a key staffer in your member of Congress's office. Now number nine on here is strategic group. And this is all about when you are setting up your idea for visiting a congressional <coughs> office, either in Washington, D.C. or in your district. Now, what I mean by strategic group is there's always strength in numbers. And part of that is that it's good for you to go in by yourself, but also with a group of people from your community. And one example of what we've done in the legislative working group when we do visits in Washington, D.C is to find somebody from either like a prominent business or a prominent school, somebody who's a school teacher or from some part of the community that they might be interested in hearing from, um, somebody who might be a human rights or a peace and justice activist. Um, it's very easy when you're lobbying to close the School of the Americas to find somebody <coughs> in the Catholic Church or another church in your community that might be interested in joining you for the meeting. And so that's something that you should keep in the back of your mind when you're putting together your group. Um, for all of you uh, who are here today, and a lot of you are young people from universities, that's another group that congressional offices really like to hear from. So it's always good to reach out to people in your community that might be interested in joining your strategic group to influence the congressperson you're meeting with. Okay, number eight, and it's something that you won't really read in uh, online on any tips or you know you won't find this in any political science textbook when you're setting up your meeting with a member of Congress they love to have it in writing they don't want it to happen over the phone they want it in writing and that might mean that you have to figure out a way to send a fax into their office or it might mean that you need to figure out the correct email address or address to send your request into now if you don't get a response Make sure you follow up and make sure you say, I sent the letter on this date, this is the date that I mailed it, but they want it in writing so that they can keep a folder based on your meeting to show the congressman and to show the different aides that you might be meeting with, um, to have it all in one folder on the things that you're doing. Yeah. Um, follow up time, How, what would you recommend, like specifically this season? If you are mailing your request in, or if you expect um, an answer to anything that you're sending in a paper-based mailing. Um, since September 11th, they've instituted all sorts of screening on mail in congressional offices. 
and it takes between it takes a very long time between two and three weeks for anything that you mail to get to a congressional office because it goes through several anth anthrax screening centers in Washington DC um, so it would be a little bit unreasonable to expect anything faster than about two or three weeks for them to respond to a paper request if it's email it should be no longer than two or three days um, they should you know have gotten back to you um, same thing with the facts. It gets to them instantaneously. So. Do you mean I make a request to have an appointment with them? Yeah. What was her question? Is there any? Her question was, was I speaking about making an appointment? <coughs> okay, let me think about what I meant by share the wealth. Hold on a second. Oh, the sharing the wealth uh, argument. Um, this is one of the other really important things about having your um, having your meeting set up appropriately. You want to make sure that you have all of the information that you need to be an effective communicator with that member of Congress. Now, you may need to find out information about how they voted in the past, and that's a good opportunity for you to contact me in the DC office or to contact uh, people in the legislative working group. And you want to make sure that everybody in your group is getting all of the information they need to have the proper visit and all of the information so they don't make a mistake or say something that might upset the congressperson that you're meeting with. So that's what that means by share the wealth. Just spreading the information that you have with your group uh, and making sure that they have the information afterwards. Um, the next part is ties into that is doing your homework. Now, you want to learn all sorts of things about your member of Congress before you step into that meeting. You want to learn things like, are they on the Foreign Affairs Committee in Congress? Are they directly making decisions in their committee about things that affect foreign policy in Latin America? Um, you want to learn things like, are they part of the Human Rights Caucus in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill? Is this a congressperson that believes that we should be doing more for human rights? Um, and that's just kind of ties into the above thing about sharing the wealth and making sure you have all of your information, everyone in your group is informed. Um, the next thing is knowing your history. And as you, you'll have a, there's a flyer up here that all of you should have had, should have gotten when you came in or, or picked up up front. And this is our flyer called the SOA Watch Legislative Campaign 101. And this is something that we have up on our website that you can print out and we will be updating every few weeks as we get more information about the legislative campaign. And knowing your history, you can go to this website, soaw.org backslash legislative, and you can find out almost anything about your member of Congress and how they voted in the past five or six years on issues related to the School of the Americas. Um, we'll talk a little bit later in the session about all of the different votes that we've had in the past few years, and you can find lists of how they've been casting the votes. You know, is my member of Congress somebody that wants the school to stay open? Are they somebody that wants the school to be shut down? Um, all of that is up on our website. So in addition to calling me about very specific things that I might know about um, their staff or who they have, who are their friends in Congress, everything that's listed here about our free online resources will help you do your homework and make sure that you have all the info. Okay, the fourth thing is the chain of command in a congressional office. Now, when you set up your meeting and they respond to you and accept your meeting request, they're gonna give you the name and title of somebody that you're gonna be meeting with in the congressional office. And it's very important to know the chain of command about who you might be assigned to meet with, because that can give you a lot of information about how important that office thinks the issue is, um, you know, to the member of Congress or to their staff. Now, kind of at the top tier, if you're able to get a meeting with the actual member of Congress, you're in great shape. You know that they care about the issue, or they at least care enough to make the time and that the representative wants to make the time to have that meeting with you. But another great fallback and another great person to meet with in a congressional office is the legislative director. Now, the legislative director manages underneath them a bunch of different legislative assistants. 
So they might have a legislative assistant that works on the economy. They might have one that works on the environment. And they almost always have one that works on foreign affairs and one that works on military issues. And both of those apply to the issue that we're trying to deal with, which is closing the SOA. It's not only a, a human rights and foreign policy issue, but it's also related to uh, actions that the US government takes with respect to the military. So understanding that that legislative director is a great person to meet with because they're making the final decisions about what legislative policy is happening in that office. You also know that you want to try to have the legislative assistant that specifically works on foreign policy or military affairs try to be part of that meeting or that you want to follow up with them in the future. Some other people that might be assigned to meet with you in an office um, that you may want to ask them a few questions about. If you get assigned to meet with a staff assistant that's answering the phones um, or doing errands for the member of Congress, you may want to call that office back and say, I'd really like to meet with the legislative director or the legislative assistant, somebody that's actually working on these issues for the congressman or the congresswoman. Um, because the staff assistant is not somebody that's going to be very knowledgeable on what you're trying to talk to them about. So you really want to demand that you're talking to the person that you need to be meeting with. Um, other people in the office you might be assigned to meet with are legislative correspondents. And the LCs, as they're called, are the people that answer letters. And that's their job, is to answer letters um, that come into the office. So that's kind of another instance where you want to talk to them and say, I want to be meeting with somebody a little bit higher up um, in that congressional office. OK, number three is the thank you. And I know everyone's you know, parents always tell them to do your thank you notes um, every time somebody does a favor or gives you a gift. And this is one of the most important aspects of building that relationship with a congressional office. I can't tell you how good it felt when I was you know, on legislative staff for a congressman to get that thank you note after I met with somebody and say, thank you for making the time and your very busy schedule to meet with us on this issue. And it's also a golden opportunity for you to start some of the follow-up with that office, right? Because in your thank you note, you can say, hey, thanks for making the time you know, to spend half an hour or an hour with us. And just a reminder, you mentioned in your meeting that you would um, talk with the congressperson and get back to me about what we uh, discussed in the meeting. Or you could say, you know, you asked for some more information on this particular vote or this particular news article that I mentioned in the meeting. And that gives you an opportunity to include that and pass along the information. Um, number two is following up. And kind of the base premise of this is you need to be persistent. And we talked about that a little bit already about making your meeting request that you shouldn't give up, even if you don't hear back from that office about getting your meeting, you should continually submit that meeting request. Let them know the issue is very important to you. But the follow-up is equally important after you get your meeting. You know, it's a great accomplishment to get that meeting with the member of Congress, but until you follow up and make sure that that office is working to answer kind of the stuff that you met with them in the meeting, then, you know, your meeting doesn't have a lot of weight until you have follow-up and they take an action on what you ask them to do. And the final thing is escalating tactics, which Jack started to mention um, when he spoke a few minutes ago. A lot of times you're going to get an office, and a member of Congress that represents you that does not always feel the same way that you feel about a certain issue. And sometimes you're going to have to go to the escalating tactics stage. So you've had your meeting, they're kind of nodding their heads and they're saying, yeah, thanks for meeting with us. You know, we'll pass along your information. You know, thanks. And then you leave and you never hear back from them. Well, that's when you jump into the escalating tactics stage and you do things like escalate that follow-up, maybe pass along the information to your local group or to your community and say, hey, can you put in a few calls this week to this congressional office because they're not getting back to me. You know, those calls aren't working. Maybe you start a petition campaign or a letter writing campaign to that office. Maybe once a month, one day a month, your local group starts writing in letters. Um, and Jack mentioned another, um, another way to escalate the tactics. Write a letter to the editor in your local community paper 
and make sure that everyone in that community that reads that newspaper knows that your member of Congress refuses to respond to your meeting requests. They're not working for the constituents they're supposed to represent. You can do things like show up at that federal building with a series of posters during the lunchtime rush hour and say our member of Congress will not act in support of human rights. They won't close uh, the School of the Americas. Why is our congressman not, you know, not in the office? Why are they not working for us if we've elected them? And so those are ideas for how you can escalate tactics if it looks like your member of Congress is not being responsive to what you've asked them to do. Thanks, Tracy. Did anybody have any, we can maybe have three or four minutes for some questions and then we'll do a little quick breakout session. You have a question in the back? What do you mean by follow-up? Um, well, some of the follow-up items we talked about were things like um, after you've had your meeting and you've asked them, you know, we want you to co-sponsor a bill to close the School of the Americas, to make sure after that meeting you go back to them and do your research and, and say, hey, did they really sign on to that bill we asked them to do? Um, they said that they would talk to another friend in Congress for us, you know, follow up and make sure that they, you know, did the things they committed to. I'm just interested to know, do you find it uh, common that the staffers underneath the uh, representative have the same opinions as the person in the staff? I'm just interested to know, like, is the office usually consistent as far as, like, opinion on a subject? Um, usually. And um, one of the things you'll find is that for instance, the legislative aides. I was a legislative aide for foreign affairs, human rights, and military issues. And so I agreed with the congressman that I worked for on every, pretty much everything under the issue areas that I worked on. But there were some things in other issue areas that I didn't agree with them on. But because though I wasn't the specialist on that, it, was, it, did, it didn't matter. Um, you know, it's very difficult to find somebody that agrees exactly with you in every way. But generally you'll find um, when you're speaking to an aide about that issue, they're pretty much in line with the person they're working for. And most aides would, would say, you know, this is my opinion. You're like, I believe the school should be closed down, but my boss doesn't. You know, they'll just be honest with you that there's a difference in opinion. A lot of them will do that. Yeah. Does this only, uh, would the 10 points only apply to the Washington office, or would they apply and can be used at the district level office? At the district level office especially, yeah. I think that um, bringing the issue locally, uh, especially doing things like that letter to the editor, uh, if you want to hold out signs outside the federal building in the county you live in, all of that's very important. But I'm just thinking of this, uh, you know, legislative director or one of the specialists I don't see them in the district office. I, I would think that they'd be in the Washington office. Yeah, most, that's, that's a really good point. Most of the legislative staff is based in the Washington, D.C. office. Um, but in each of the district offices, they have constituent representatives, um, and they have other kind of legislative aides or, or campaign aides and things like that that work in the district offices. And you'll find that a lot of the people that are hired by that congressman, uh, congressperson um, are originally from that congressional district. For instance, I worked for a congressman from Austin, Texas. And it's where I, I went to the university, uh, at the University of Austin in, in Texas. And so the legislative staff from DC often go back on the weekends with the member of Congress. And that's a good opportunity for you to meet with them when they go back to the district. Yeah. Yeah, we had the in our, my organization that I worked with a lot of volunteer there for one. They uh, uh, they told me that they had different problems in the past to spread that out and for example to make credit over newspapers because the newspapers didn't react. So when they wrote to the newspapers in general about the SOA protest or when they tried to do something like uh, spread raise publicity, raise consciousness by uh, using the newspapers, they didn't react because they were like, I don't know, they were not on the side, they could not believe that the SOA is doing that stuff, they won't believe, so what could you do then? I mean, 
Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, not all newspapers will be willing to write articles about closing the school. Um, that, that's why sometimes it can be easier to try to get something in the Outlook section or the letters to the editor section. And usually you'll find that there's a lot of um, more independent media newspapers in your area. For instance, in Washington, D.C., there's the Washington City Paper. Um, and there's also a lot of um, different neighborhood newspapers for particular areas of a city or grassroots uh, media. And so even just starting there, if you write a really good piece or a really good article, sometimes it gets picked up by those larger newspapers, especially if it you know, gets posted online and there are a lot of comments um, and they're getting a lot of feedback. So that's one strategy too. A lot of members of Congress, you know, even if they seem to be really bad on foreign policy issues, like a lot of Republicans are, they do, a lot of them are want to be strong on human rights. They want to be strong on uh, and be anti-torture. And so being able to connect the issue of the School of the Americas to things like the torture manuals being used as part of the curriculum, that can really appeal to all sorts of people. Um, so bringing that moral connection and the political connection as well can be important. Um, and we'll talk a little bit, um, part of the breakout ex exercise we're about to do um, is going to help you with the different arguments you can make in meetings. And one of the really strong ones right now, um, there are a lot of very fiscally conservative Republicans and members of Congress. And they, a lot of them, vote with us on these amendments to cut the funding for the school just because they don't like foreign aid and they want to save money. And so a very powerful argument right now with any member of Congress is how can I balance the budget? How can I cut spending? This is a way we can do it that not only cuts military spending, but also can be a pro-human rights vote in Congress. So that's a really powerful argument to think about. Um, any meeting is, is very beneficial, um, but it's always good to you know, have different diverse opinions coming into that meeting. So it's good to have you know, as many people as you can have. Four is a really good number, three to four people. Uh, you don't want it to be too large uh, because then not everybody gets a voice and it can be a little bit overwhelming for the congressional office. Uh, but yeah, even just going in yourself and showing that you know you feel really passionate about the issue is just as good. Um, but it's really good to think about a strategic group as well and who you can pull in from different types of um, constituencies in the community. Brad. Um, have you done some research about uh, what would be the best way to identify the most, uh, best candidates to be influential members of a strategic group that you'd like to put together for the given state? Uh, oh, for different members of a strategic group for a particular state? Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's another good question. Um, some members of Congress are influenced by different types of constituencies more than others. Um, for instance, there are a lot of members uh, in the state of Michigan and Pennsylvania that are big um, labor states that are very influenced by having somebody come in from a union or a labor organizing uh, background. And so um, that's something that I would encourage you to give me a call in the D.C. office and ask me more specific questions about your member of Congress, and I can kind of help you out with what they might be persuaded by. Um, and another tip, too, that I have used a lot in the past uh, there's a website called opensecrets.org, and if you go to that website, you can find any member of Congress and exactly how many dollars different organizations have given to their campaigns, um, and they, it's updated pretty frequently. So we can go to the website, and we work a lot with the United Auto Workers um, to help us pass our legislation. And so we go to the website before votes, and we say, okay, here are the 20 members of Congress that have each got $15,000 from the United Auto Workers in the last few months, how can we you know, make sure the congressperson remembers the UAW has been giving them money, um, the UAW is now asking them to do something and, and follow up on that. So that website's really, uh, really informative for where money is going to congressional offices. Okay, um, I wanted to go over really quickly this lobby packet, because this will help for the breakout exercise that we're about to do. And it's just going to be a few minutes, um, and it will really help you with your visits and coming up with the best arguments for closing the school. 
So I'm not going to read all the way through it because I don't want to kind of waste your time. But the very first page, it's a duplicate of the flyer that you have. Um, I really encourage you to contact your grassroots SOA Watch Council member. They have a lot of information um, over the years that they've collected about how members of Congress vote and different people that you can pull together from your community to join you in your meetings. Um, there's also some other information here about how you can access resources that we have in the legislative campaign. Um, a lot of the points that Jack made tonight, and some of the ones I did as well, are covered in this tips for making contact with your member of Congress. Um, there are also some useful websites at the top here that you can find more information for your meetings. So I really encourage you to go over that flyer. And if there are people that want any of these flyers in this packet, um, or any, maybe the entire lobby packet, just give me a call or send me an email and I can send you free packets, as many as you need for your group. The next flyer in here is the Latin America pulls out of WinSec flyer. And this is one of our newest flyers to talk about the Latin America project that School of the Americas Watch has been working on for the past few years. Uh, many of you might have heard about this throughout the weekend, and you'll read about it in the program and hear about it elsewhere. We have opened an office in Latin America, and part of what the, uh, the Latin America project does is we go directly to the defense ministers and the presidents of different countries throughout Latin America, and we ask them directly to no longer send students to the School of the Americas. And so far, so far we've had five countries make public announcements they'll no longer send students. So this has been a really big blow to WINSEC to lose all of these students from the different countries. And this is also a very, very persuasive argument to use in your meetings with members of Congress especially to refer to um, Argentina, Costa Rica, and Uruguay, which are some of the nations that the United States really wants to continue having good relationships with and really concerns them when they see that countries like these are you know, distancing themselves from the United States because the school remains open. So this is a great flyer for you to photocopy and give to a congressional aide or to just make some of the arguments that are listed on this sheet when you attend your congressional meetings. Where is the Latin America office? Venezuela. The next thing in the packet are the talking points to close the School of the Americas WINSEC. And this is something that we update every once in a while as more persuasive or new news uh, comes to us about uh, the best reasons why we should close the school. And we try to keep this as updated as possible. These 10 reasons are some of the best arguments you can make in your congressional, uh, congressional visits. And so this will be the subject of our next breakout session where you'll get a chance uh, to figure out which ones might be the best one for your member of Congress or which ones you think would be the most effective. Um, the next thing after those talking points looks like this. It's a press release that was sent out by the SOA Watch office in August of 2007. One of the difficulties that we've had in congressional meetings is that members of Congress believe that now that it is WINSEC and no longer the School of the Americas, it's now a reformed institution. And so they've really been asking for specific cases that tie graduates of WINSEC or instructors at WINSEC since it's changed its name uh, to prove that the school doesn't have an effective human rights program and isn't able to do the things that their mission statement says. This press release talks about two people who were at WINSEC in 2003 and 2004 who are linked to human rights and other crimes in Latin America. And so we have a number of these cases that are really effective in congressional meetings. And this is definitely something that you should bring up uh, as a meeting in your congressional office. Because one of the most common questions you're going to get from a staffer or a member of Congress is, didn't this school change? You know, it's not the School of the Americas anymore. Do you have any current information about WINSEC? And this is one of the things that you can bring up in your meeting. Um, hopefully, all of you saw this down at the vigil site today. This is the petition to Barack Obama. We uh, launched a campaign about two weeks 
ago uh, to have as many petition signatures as we can get by early February to ask Obama to close the School of the Americas by executive order. If you did not get a chance to sign this at the vigil site today, you can also sign this electronically on, <coughs> excuse me, on our website. And these are also available to print out as a PDF document from our website as well. Um, we have a way to get these petitions directly into Obama's hands and have a direct ask from somebody very influential in politics that we're not able to disclose now, sorry to have the suspense, in early February. So as many signatures as we can get on these petitions before that meeting happens would be very, very good for us. So we would need to mail it to you by January? Yeah, like the last week. And if you, you know, for some reason it's more difficult for you to collect them on the paper copies, just handing out um, the URL, the website address. It's uh, www.soaw.org backslash petition. And that's how you can access the petition on, on our website. Question about petitions. Um, it's most powerful to have all of the information set up, because I know that in my experience, petitioning is something that's all racial. Don't want to put down an email or, or a phone because Yeah, I mean, I would say as long as you have your name and your signature and you have um, the city and state and zip code where you're from, that would be sufficient. Um, just so they know that you're a unique individual from a particular state and they can say, oh, look, here are a bunch of people from Kentucky or from California, or look at all the states that are represented. I think that. And do they really go through each one and count to make sure that they're different? How extensive is the process for counting petitions? Well, I think in some cases, with a petition as large as the campaign that we're doing, um, we already have thousands of signatures online, and we had at least 10,000 collected just today at the vigil site, which is an amazing number. Um, and we hope to have even more tomorrow. We're printing out about 2,000 more pages to circulate tomorrow morning. So um, I, I don't think that they probably have the staff power to check each one individually, um, but I'm sure that they flip through and see the different diverse states that are represented and things like that. So I think that's one of the things that they look at. Um, last thing in the packet is uh, close the SOA Winset Congressional Visit Report Form. And this is a really useful tool, not just for yourselves, but for us in the DC office. This can really help you collect your thoughts at the end of the meeting and keep a record about some of the things that the staff might have mentioned to you might forget after a week or so after your visit happens and we also really encourage you to fill out these forms even if it's just based on a phone call you have with an aide in an office and to mail that to me or the DC office so we can keep uh, kind of a log and keep an idea of whether or not there are different staffers in the office whether or not their position is changing and things like that um, and this is one of the other reasons we mentioned earlier and really encouraged you to contact me in the DC office before you have your meetings because we have about 10 years worth of these forms for all sorts of congressional offices. And they have a wealth of information on them that we've gotten about, you know, even just basic questions they've asked like, you know, how do you think this ties into the drug war? And you know, just little nuances we've gotten about, you know, how they feel about certain things. Anybody have you have, you have a question? Yeah. Um, this might be a, a little too personal, but what happens to your job when the SOA is closed down? That's a very good question. Um, SOA Watch, we you know obviously most of our work is tied to closing down the SOA, but we do a lot of other um, work on issues related to Latin America. One of them is Plan Colombia and military assistance in general, uh, like the Merida Initiative to Mexico. That's another issue that we work on. Um, even beyond the School of the Americas, WINSEC, there's something like 140 other U.S. military training facilities that train soldiers from Latin American militaries. Um, so there's the strength in focusing on one institution first and getting that precedent to have the oversight and close the rest of them. So that's important too, but the work, you know, this really is just the tip of the iceberg. It's important to remember that U.S. military influence Latin America 
goes way beyond just the School of the Americas. This just happens to be the most egregious example over the years. Okay, so for the next five minutes or so, get in a little group um, of about four or five people in your row or in your area and come up with what you think is the most strategic argument for closing the school down. Okay, and it can be based on anything in this packet. But I want to warn you, after the five or ten minutes is up, I'm going to ask you to tell it to me, and I'm going to pretend to be a congressional staffer, and I'm going to ask you a tough question back to that question so that you can practice, okay? Okay, who wants to go first? Who's <laughs> interested going first? You, you all? You go first? Sure. Um, well, our, uh, we'll that that, uh, <laughs> And what we were speaking also of our of our congressman, who is a uh, he's the only Iraq veteran in Congress. Um, he's a blue dog Democrat, and he voted he did not vote for the School of the Americas last time. Whereas his previous two uh, his, his two previous Congress people were Republicans who co-sponsored the bill who were co-sponsors to close the School of the Americas. So it's led to a little animosity between us, and. Uh, as, as we were saying, that this is a human rights travesty that is viewed, you know, not even, if, even in America, they say it's always not, they don't train terrorists, but around the world, they do it, that they train terrorists. And it just gives us uh, a horrible black eye when it comes to human rights. And also, it's just, uh, and also as a blue dog Democrat, um, he's always talking about balancing the budget. So again, it's another opportunity for him to balance the budget. So we really kind of like specific, uh, uh, you know, kind of a for him. So that's what we decided. Okay, so you would say, you would say to him that it would be a way to save money? A way to save money and also at the same time um, showing us that we, we appreciate human rights again. Okay, okay. So what if a congressional aide said back to you, um, why is human rights in Latin America important? Why does anybody care about Latin American human rights? Well, aren't, there, aren't there areas of the world where there are worse human rights occurring, like in Darfur, and shouldn't we focus on that instead? Well, of course, but uh, of course, as America, we're supposed to be the shining beacon of human rights in, this, in the world. We are the ultimate democracy, or at least it's how we sell ourselves. So uh, again, uh, shouldn't we stop trying to put a hypocritical, hypocritical face to the world? Okay, yeah, good answer. All right, who else wants to go? Brad, do you want to go? Sure. <laughs> I'll put you on the spot. All right, uh, we have uh, polished two arguments. Uh, the first one is that the uh, study by uh, Karen McCoy, Catherine McCoy showed that uh, the reforms of the uh, uh, human uh, rights programs at the uh, School of the Americas have proven to be ineffective because over a 30-year period, the uh, rate of, uh, at which graduates committed human rights violations did not change significantly. Therefore, it's uh, unrealistic to, uh, to accept the argument that by changing the name in one, uh, overnight in 2001, all of a sudden the curriculum changed and the, the behavior of the graduates changed. Our second argument is that the, in this time of economic hardship for the United States, we have seen that uh, the uh, Trade relationships, uh, or Latin America is developing more trade relationships with other countries, and the, the money spent on the School of the Americas would be better spent uh, given uh, some form of a uh, program to, to further our exports to Latin America, so as these tax uh, subsidies to exporters of American goods. Okay. What, if, what if a staffer said back to you, but, but that McCoy study was done before the name changed, and that's all the SOA, and that's all old. And now, you know, WITSEX reform, they have, human, they have human rights classes. So why, why does that study still relevant? Well, the study is relevant because the, uh, the, the basic um, things which, which influenced the outcome of the study did not suddenly change. Uh, the uh, staff remained the same, the bulk of the curriculum stayed the same, and the, uh, the uh, countries, which were, were, and the militaries, which were contributing students, also stayed, did not change over time. 
And another important uh, thing to add to that, not just when you're talking about the study as a talking point, but in general, they're going to say things like the argument, well, that was the old SOA, and you know, this has now been renamed to WINSEC. And the old SOA also had human rights curriculum. The only thing that's changed is that they have a big public relations department that talks about how they do human rights all the time. That doesn't mean that it's something new and that WINSEC has reformed itself. It means that they now have pretty packaging and money to spend on promoting it. That's the only difference. Is it still voluntary, the human rights cure course? No, it, it, it was mandatory under the SOA, and it's also mandatory now. But the other thing that you could say is, is eight hours of human rights where the, kid, you know, the students can just sleep in the back of the classroom adequate when it's alongside combat training for another, like, 300 hours, you know, is that really, you know, that's probably just a token human rights class. For those of you that might not have heard, she was talking about restoring the image of the United States around the world as a leader on human rights and, and to restore that image in Latin America. Um, and you can tie that into the flyer that we talked about in the lobby packet about the Latin America project. Um, let's see if I this one about Latin America pulling out and five countries saying they're going to no longer send students. Um, something that was pretty much universal in a lot of these meetings is defense ministers and leaders of these countries were saying, you don't need to tell us about the School of the Americas. We felt the effects of this ourselves. And we know that the name change is just a name change. We see this school as a negative human rights message the United States sends and that we can, you know, the U.S. continues to train terrorists. So that's a very persuasive argument to a member of Congress. And we found that in a lot of our congressional visits because, you know, we might be playing the semantics name game in the United States about whether or not it's the School of the Americas or whether or not it's WINSEC, but if countries in Latin America see it as the same thing, then it doesn't really matter. So that ends up being a really good argument. Well, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the three campaigns that we've worked on in the last few months and how those are going to change a little bit um, in 2009 and just so you guys can be ready to see what's going to happen um, and the information you're going to see on our website and what types of votes that you can expect to see um, us publicize through all of our materials in the next few months. Um, in, in this flyer that um, you picked up up here, there's a brief history of our legislative campaign in the U.S. Congress, and I won't reread it. You can read uh, read it after the session, but it'll give you an idea of just um, how powerful SOA Watch and other organizations working on this issue have been able to uh, influence Congress to act on this stuff. Um, We've had so many amendments and so many bills and continually built up support in the U.S. Congress that we are now within six votes of cutting the funding for the School of the Americas. Um, the first part of our legislative campaign is our standalone bill in the House of Representatives. And many of you might know or be familiar with the bill H.R. 1707. Uh, 17, H.R. 1707 is a standalone bill that would suspend operations at the School of the Americas while an investigation takes place into the connections between human rights abuses that have, the graduates have committed, um, torture manuals that have been used as, as the curriculum at the school, and it does an overall assessment of what the United States is doing with military training in Latin America. So that's what we call this bill kind of the investigation bill. It's what gets at uh, all of the crimes the SOA has been linked to and all of the ways that WINSEC might be having problems now. And that standalone bill is introduced by Congressman Jim McGovern, who is our champion in the U.S. Congress. And uh, many of you had a chance to hear him speak here last year when he came to the vigil. Um, He's a great office to talk to if you're ever in Washington, D.C. Um, their office is always pretty open for you to go in and say thank you and to ask them questions about the School of the Americas. And they're, they're a very good resource. Now, that standalone bill um, is one of the first things that we're going to be working on in 2009. Now, 
We have a spring event that I wanted all of you uh, to have the information on, and you'll also find this in the program, in the printed programs that have been circulating throughout the weekend. Um, every year um, at the beginning of a Congress, in February, on President's Day weekend, SOA Watch hosts a three-day event in Washington, D.C., and the first half of the weekend is a strategy meeting where anybody who is working on the issue of closing the School of the Americas can come into Washington, D.C. and join us and everyone else across the country, our partner organizations, um, other organizations in Washington, D.C., and we plan out what our strategies and campaigns are um, for the next few months and for the, the remainder of the year. And there was a question earlier about what happens if the School of the Americas closes. You know, isn't everybody at SOA Watch out of a job? Well, that's part of what we talk about at our strategy meeting. Um, how is the School of the Americas Watch going to move forward? What are, should we start working on other issues? Should we be working more on Plan Colombia? Should we be working more on immigration issues? Um, what other things in Latin America should School of the Americas Watch be working on? So that's an opportunity for your voice to get heard in the planning of what our organization does in DC. And part of that weekend is to have a lobby preparation session where we put information together for you, packets that you can deliver to congressional offices, and we teach you all about what the current arguments are and what your member of Congress, you know, where they're located and who their staffer is. And the final day of the weekend, we all go to Capitol Hill um, to visit congressional offices and to lobby. So that's an open invitation to anybody, and you should spread the word too from wherever you're coming uh, from to join us that weekend. And during that weekend, the focus will be on the new standalone bill. And Congress likes to make it difficult for us, and every two years we have to change our bill number. But it's the same text, it's the same bill, it does the same action, uh, Congress just assigns it a new number. So in early spring, um, be watching our website, and if you're on our email list, uh, you'll get this information, but there'll be a new bill number, and it won't be HR 1707, but it's the same thing. Um, another thing that we, uh, another part of our legislative campaign uh, that you might have heard about this weekend, or if you've been involved with SOA Watch for a while, uh, we have Representative McGovern introduce an amendment to an appropriations bill to cut off all of the funding for scholarships uh, for graduates and instructors to come down uh, to Fort Benning to work at Windsor. Now, these appropriations bills are really huge spending bills. And the one that we attach an amendment to is the Foreign Operations Appropriations Bill that the House of Representatives passes. Now, that appropriations bill does almost everything to do with foreign policy, everything the United States does. So, for instance, if we want to give food aid through um, USAID, all of that goes in the Foreign Operations Appropriations Bill. Um, and it just so happens that any time we give military training or military education to different countries around the world, all of that gets funded in the Foreign Operations Appropriations Bill. So, we're able to amend that bill and say we are going to strike and cut all of the funding that goes to the School of the Americas WINSEC, uh, where it gives scholarship money to all of these graduates from different countries to come here to train. So we had we had that amendment in June of 2006, or actually May of 2006, and we lost by a margin about of about 17 votes. Um, so it was it was a little bit sad for us to lose that amendment by so many votes, but we have not had a vote in Congress in about six or seven years. And it was our first vote that we had since they changed the name. And so we were actually pleasantly surprised with it being a fully Republican-controlled Congress to get that close and be able to get within 17 votes. So we decided to try again in June of 2007, and we got within six votes of passing the amendment. And since then, a lot has changed. Uh, you might have heard this announcement throughout the weekend, but um, in this month's elections, in the November elections, 38 of our opponents during that vote lost their seats in Congress, which
which is way more than that margin that we needed of six votes. So we're in a very, very uh, good place. We're very optimistic about uh, that funding amendment this year. So an important thing for you to remember when that comes up uh, you know, in the next few months is to be watching our website. And uh, when we make that announcement that the vote is coming, uh, it's very important for you to forward our emails and our alerts to as many places as possible. Um, I know I mentioned earlier in the training just how important it is to have a large volume of phone calls, a large volume of emails going to the office. And we'll make sure you have all of the information on which offices we need you to call um, and just, you know, just when the votes happen. Um, the third part of our legislative campaign uh, in the, oh, yeah. And when that happens, would you rather get the email then instead of call? We have an automatic um, email feature that we use on our website. So it allows you to plug in your name and your zip code, basically. And it matches your zip code to the congressional district. So for instance, my member of Congress is Congressman James Moran from Virginia. And the computer program recognizes my zip code and matches it to his congressional district. So anytime during that week or the day of the vote, um, you can there's a letter we'll have on the website, and you type in your address and hit send, and it automatically emails that congressional office for whoever your representative is, and they'll get a letter saying how you feel about the vote. So you can do that instantaneously if, if you're not able to make a phone call. Um, but we found we've been pretty much able to shut down the congressional switchboard when we have these votes because we get so many votes coming in. So it's good to do the phone calls as well. Well, that's the great thing about being a college student because you kind of have the dual, I could contact my congressperson where I'm going to school or at home. And so one thing that we've really encouraged students to do um, around the vote, um, you know, we wouldn't want you to encourage you to, you know, call both. It's certainly not a bad thing. I mean, most offices don't really check when they have this huge volume of calls. But you might want to be strategic about it. You might want to say, hey, if Congressman Jim McGovern is my representative, I mean, he's our supporter. So rather than where I go to school, you know, in the Massachusetts area, I'm going to go call where I, you know, where my parents live or where my home address is. And you can just, you can do it that way. And that's, you know, a little bit, it's above board. You're only calling one member of Congress and you're just picking the one that, yeah, you want to associate with. One thing, and especially in the San Francisco area, because or in big cities around the country, congressional districts are so small that one zip code could span um, two congressional districts. Or you could, you know, literally the street where you live could be the dividing line between one member of Congress or the other. So oftentimes we'll encourage people that live in big cities, you know, to contact somebody else in the city that might not be on board. Um, one other thing to think about, you may live in a congressional district where your member of Congress is going to support us no matter what. Um, in those instances, you could be asking them to do other things other than just voting with us. And things that you can ask them to do um, are things like giving a one-minute speech in the, on the floor of Congress that day. Um, every day that the Congress is in session, they start out the day by opening up the floor for one minute or two minute speeches for members of Congress. So you can ask your member of Congress, you know, that week of the vote, hey, will you go down in the morning and give a one minute or a two minute speech, you know, encouraging all of your colleagues to vote on the amendment that's coming out today. Um, another thing that you can do is talk to your member of Congress that might be a supporter and say, hey, you're on this committee with Congressman Johnson, and you know, we imagine you're pretty good friends because you've worked together a lot on this committee. We're not sure how he's going to vote. Would you mind talking to your friends in Congress and asking them that they vote with you? And that's something that we've tried to do a lot with um, members of Congress that might already be supportive, especially longtime supporters, and have them go to other people um, you know, that they might be friends with that we're not sure about. Anyone else have any questions? And I can do the one last, oh, yeah. The 1707, you said, is a call to suspend the school. That's not the same as closing it. It's suspended for investigation, but how long would that be? Or who would do the investigating? Well, it's written into the legislation that 
it would be an independent investigation. And this is um, something that we've worked a long time with Amnesty International on. Um, Amnesty International felt that there should be a suspension rather than an abrupt closure because they wanted to give the opportunity for an independent, independent investigation because it might be they felt that WinSec really had performed. So they, in order for Amnesty International and a lot of those other organizations to help work in this coalition, they really wanted it to be worded in that way. And another one of the things that we built into the bill was an overall assessment of whether or not U.S. military training in Latin America is effective, or you know, how are we spending our money, what are the different training schools, um, and to make sure that when that investigation takes place, it, does, it's not, it doesn't end up being a panel of military officers doing the investigation. It ends up being an independent body that can really um, include people from the Human Rights Committee and people from, you know, not just Republicans, not just Democrats, but a balanced viewpoint. So um, couldn't this be a talking point, a positive talking point for our congressmen? We're not asking to close the school, we're asking just for an independent investigation. Right, which yeah. Which might go for. Right, that's a really good point. And the other thing, the other reason SOA Watch was behind doing this suspension bill was, you know, we feel confident that the outcome of this investigation will result in the closure of the school. There's been no, there's been no independent investigation of the School of the Americas. There's been zero accountability for the fact that torture manuals were used there, and the fact that a high percentage of graduates end up committing human rights abuses, you know, that has to end up being part of the investigation. There has to be some sort of assessment and answer to that, and there never has been. So that's part of the reason why SOA Watch believed that was a good way to go. It's been quite a few years since we've had a Senate bill. We have not had a Senate bill since the name change. And so um, we actually had a pretty long strategy meeting on Friday morning um, this weekend at the Legislative Working Group. And we talked through building our Senate strategy in the next few months. So we have a list of senators that we're approaching to introduce amendments on the Senate side and to have the same H.R. 1707 bill introduced um, in the Senate as well. Did you raise your hand? Oh, pass the same thing. Okay. The last type of legislative campaign that we have, in addition to the standalone bill, in addition to the uh, bill to cut money for the school, um, you might have heard about the FOIA requests that we've made um, to the Army to make sure we get the names of graduates and instructors of the school. Now, the reason this is so important is because we're able to make direct connections between people who are taking classes at the school or instructing at the school, and whether or not they've committed crimes in Latin America. And one of the arguments that we're able to make is, if they're taking all of these human rights courses, why are they going home and committing massacres? It means that not only is the curriculum not working, but it's a reason to no longer have the training, right? So, in, in 2004, I mean, first of all, we had been making these requests for years. They used to just fax the names to us from Fort Benning and it was never a problem. And so we started making all of these connections between the new school, WinSec, and they, start, they, you know, we think that there was a correlation between when we released all of this information and then cutting off all sources to that information. All of our requests for, you know, Freedom of Information Act requests were denied immediately, and we've received no information um, from fiscal year 2004 forward. So last year, um, a coalition of members of Congress introduced an amendment in the House of Representatives uh, to require the Pentagon to release all of that information to the public. So the, the SOA Watch and other human rights organizations could get those names um, and continue to do the research. We won that vote in May of 2008, and it was 220, you know, it was a 30 plus vote margin. It was pretty decisive. And we had the backing of a lot of members of Congress. Um, unfortunately, um, at the end of the summer, right around August or September, because there was not an amendment on the Senate side, there was only an amendment on the House side, when those two bills had to come together in conference committee to be reconciled, 
they had to make a decision about things that were in one bill and not in the other bill and whether or not they'd make it to the final version. And that amendment was stripped from the bill and did not make it when it was uh, signed into law. And so that kind of ties into the question that was asked earlier about how should we continue to build our campaign in the Senate to make sure that in the future this doesn't happen. And so as the Way Watch is working on building our Senate campaign to make sure that we're successful in both houses in 2009. Um, so part of uh, our legislative strategy now is to continue to put pressure on Congress um, and uh, on the Pentagon and Army institutions to make sure we get those names. Um, we, uh, we took a tour of the school and uh, the chaplain told us that the reason they don't want to release the names is because he's afraid that those people will be targeted by the drug cartels and the, you know, the guerrillas or whatever because they have the special training and that was his reason. Yeah, to, protect it, the, to protect his brain. Yeah, it, it's really funny about the way WinSec responds to these arguments. Um, you know, first of all, it took them about six months to come up with anything. And then it turns out that that argument doesn't make a lot of sense when your newspapers publish the photos, the names, where the cities they live in, like how many kids they have and their wives' names. Like if, you, if they don't want to be releasing, releasing personal information, then they shouldn't be using it to promote the school. I mean, what they're afraid of is the stories that we use when we use just their name and their country of origin to say this person trained at the school and committed a human rights abuse. So it, it isn't, you know, really consistent. Um, and that's one thing that you can bring up, you know, if a member of Congress or a staffer says, but we don't want, you know, this private information, you know, going up on the SOA Watch website, well, it's all it's been released to us for decades. We had names from 1946 to 2003, and you can't prove any case for why somebody was targeted based on something on our website. Um, and something else that you can say in answer to that argument is uh, the reason our requests were denied was a section of the Freedom of Information Act to protect personal privacy. Well, we're not asking for phone numbers. We're not asking for addresses. We're only asking for name, you know, their rank, and their country of origin. And the second thing is the Freedom of Information Act is written to protect U.S. citizens, not people coming from Latin American militaries on our tax dollar dime to take training at Fort Benning. It's a very different situation. That's something that they're continuing to say this argument that they don't want this private information out, but in reality it's, it's not private information. We're not, we're just asking for a name and where, where you're coming from, you know, so. Do those three campaigns make sense? The standalone bill, the amendment to cut the funding, and then this amendment to get the names? Well, we anticipate all of those things happening between June and March. Uh, well, I guess the standalone bill will be introduced and the process will begin to have those amendments introduced uh, in the early or the late spring, early summer of next year. So um, all of you should expect that we'll have some sort of action uh, on those next year. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm available to answer questions anytime. Um, my email address is all over these flyers. You can call the DC office. Um, I'm willing to talk to you guys anytime.